Testing. Testing, 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 testing. Testing, testing. Testing, 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 testing. How's it going, Christopher? <laughs> All right, so we're just going to jump right into this. So welcome to another Hoopo stream, and today we're going to be looking at a paper called Tool LLM. So facilitating large language models to master 16,000 plus real-world APIs. So an API is an application programming interface, I'm pretty sure. I forget exactly what the acronym stands for, but basically it's uh, a set of functions that someone's written that allow you to do things. It's a very generic term, but the way that you interact with someone else's software generally is you're interacting with their API. And it's turned out that language models large language models can basically learn to use these APIs without having ever been trained on these APIs. So basically, uh, put succinctly, large language models can zero shot uh, novel APIs. But uh, there's some issues, right? And we've actually encountered some of these issues before ourselves. So we've uh, on this channel done some tool LLM type stuff. We had a project called Paperbot. That was a series of coding streams and then we created our own uh, tool LLM in context and then we ended up using the OpenAI Functions API uh, which is basically OpenAI's own version of this paper. Tool LLM. So you basically give OpenAI a bunch of APIs or functions within a specific API, such as, oh, here's how I would uh, get customer by revenue, and these are the different things that I need in order to uh, call this function, and this is what the function is going to return, right? Uh, and it actually, whenever we actually tested it, the functions API was actually worse than the one that we made, just from scratch, super vanilla, because uh, I forget exactly why, but the, the reasoning that I, we ended up coming to is that the functions API is, a, is kind of a stickler and it's very particular about the types and the names and it ended up not being as flexible as the one that we made that was just from scratch that just said, hey, here's like four functions and pick one of these four functions. So people have gone even further and now you have basically an open source version of this, which they're calling Tool LLM. Uh, sounds like Gorilla. Let's see the difference. Yeah, there's probably a bunch of different versions of these. So, uh, one of the first things I noticed here is that this is called Tool LLM, the paper, but then the accompanying GitHub repo is called Tool Bench, and then now they have a picture that says Tool Llama. So, they're basically trying to shotgun this out into the internet, right? You have three different names, and you try to get uh, all the search engines to point to your thing. So this is called search engine optimization, where you basically try to get your thing, in this case, this GitHub repo and this paper, to go viral. And in order to do that, you basically want as many different like tokens that people are going to search on Google search or any of these other things to point to your thing. So this tactic of giving a single thing many different names, as soon as you see that, generally that's not necessarily good. Generally means that the people here, they're trying to sell you something, right? And when I scrolled and I saw this picture, I think I understand a little bit better now. So haven't read this paper yet, but just look at this picture and uh, what do you see here, right? What's weird about this? Right, okay, that's the OpenAI logo, that makes sense. Oh, okay, llamas, you got a picture about llama, llamas open source, that makes sense, okay, that's fine. 
But then what is this rapid API here? Rapid API, rapid API. They keep putting that everywhere. So what the fuck is that? And then look that up. It's a startup. Okay, rapid API hub. You can come in here, you can add your API. And at the end of the day, what do these people want? They want money. They want to get your money. So I think we'll read into this paper and see kind of where the technical merit is, but just from the this kind of preliminary cursory examination, this is definitely a startup that is trying to get you to use their rapid API. Maybe they already had an API service before ChatGPT came out, and now with these LLMs, they've realized that they have to basically uh, take their product to the next level, and now they're trying to basically wrap their rapid API product with uh, a llama LLM. So we gather blah, blah, blah from Rapid API, a platform that hosts massive real world APIs. So, all right, so let's put that aside. Now let's look at the actual paper. This is coming from a big group of Chinese researchers here. You got WeChat, which is a product. It's like a phone app that's basically payments, it's uh, social media, it's messaging, it's like all of the all of your social media apps that you usually have in the US that are separate, they're actually combined in China. And it's actually super convenient, but it's also a little bit Orwellian. But the parent company for WeChat is called Tencent. And that's the company that owns WeChat. Uh, and then you got a couple universities here, you got Ch Tsinghua University, Renmin University, and Yale University. Uh, and then two startups here, Model Best Inc. and Jihu Inc. And I bet you one of these two is the Rapid API uh, startup. Okay. So let's go to this abstract. Despite the advancements of open source large language models and their variants, so open source large language models are Llama and Vicuña, although at this point it's Llama 2 is by far the best one. They remain significantly limited in performing high-level tasks, such as following human instructions to use external tools. Uh, I would not call this significantly limited. <laughs> I think they work quite well out of the box. You don't need to have a uh, specialized training to have them use API or have an LLM use an API. Instead of the tool use domain, uh, this, this in contrast to state-of-the-art LLMs which have demonstrated excellent tool use capability but are unfortunately closed source. Okay, so I don't know if I agree with that. Is Llama 2 particularly worse than ChatGPT? To facilitate tool use within an open source, we introduce ToolLM, a general tool use framework for data construction, model training, and evaluation. We first present ToolBench, okay, so ToolBench benchmark, an instruction tuning data set for tool use, which is created automatically using ChatGPT. Specifically, we collect 16,000 real world RESTful APIs. So this is their rapid API data set. Uh, then prompt ChatGPT, let's actually do that red for the data set, and then prompt ChatGPT to generate diverse human instructions following these APIs. Finally, we use ChatGPT to search for a valid solution path, a chain of API calls for each instruction. And to make the search process more efficient, we develop a novel depth-first search-based decision tree. Okay, so depth-first search is a one of many strategies for searching a tree or a graph. And if you've ever done programming problems, this is a very common uh, programming problem where implement a breadth first search, implement the depth first search, and then there's uh, the optimal search is usually a combination of those called uh, A star. Um, but okay, so they have some depth first search based way of picking the right API function. Enabling LLMs to evaluate multiple reasoning traces and expand the search space. We show that DFSDD significantly enhances the planning and reasoning capabilities of LLMs. Uh, <laughs> significantly? Okay. More efficient tool use assessment. We develop an automatic evaluator, tool eval. Okay, so tool eval, I guess, is part of tool bench. We fine-tune Llama on Toolbench and obtain Tool Llama. 
Our tool eval reveals that Tool Llama demonstrates a remarkable ability to execute complex instructions and generalize to unseen APIs and exhibits comparable performance to ChatGPT. To enable the pipeline more practical, we devise a neural API retriever to recommend appropriate APIs for each instruction. Negating the need for manual API selection. The codes, trains, models, and demos are all available here. Okay, so basically, it sounds like they're gonna have a Llama 2 that's fine-tuned on this data set, and then they're going to wrap it inside a depth-first search that's gonna perform a bunch of inference calls, maybe look at the return, and kind of automatically pick the best API function to call. And then they're gonna give us a benchmark that includes uh, holdout test sets as well as evaluation tools so that we can evaluate how good uh, a language model is at the task of uh, API usage. And not just any API, but specifically generalizing to unseen APIs, right? If you have to fine tune your LLM for your API, it's gonna be annoying every time you release a new function, you're gonna to have to retune or refine tune your model. So being able to generalize and zero shot to uh, unseen APIs is very useful. Uh, all right, so let's get into this introduction here. Uh, tool learning aims to unleash the power of large language models to effectively interact with various tools to accomplish various tasks. By integrating LLMs, we can greatly expand their utility and empower them to serve as efficient intermediaries between users and the vast ecosystem of applications. Yeah, it's kind of interesting to think about a future where when you're pinging an API, you're no longer pinging it with a specific function and a specific uh, uh, values for specific parameters that have specific data types, maybe you ping it with just language and then on the actual server side, the company that has that API will translate that query into an actual function call. That function call gets executed and then that the return of that gets turned back into text. So it'll be interesting to see where these intermediaries that are LLMs are actually uh, where are they? Are they on the client side or is there is it running on your computer or is it running on the uh, computer of the service that you're trying to get access to? Although open source LLMs speaking to the fridge and it answers back. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if your fridge has an API. Is there fridges that have APIs? Probably. Fridge with API access. Let's go here, smart fridge. List of endpoints. Nothing here. But yeah, I'm sure there's a fridge that has like a API where you can ask, what's the temperature? What's this? What's your name? What's the last thing that was put in? And so on. Uh, okay, open source LLMs, they still lack sophistication in performing higher level tasks such as understanding human instructions and appropriately interacting with tools. So I think they're kind of making a mountain out of a molehill here. They're kind of trying to paint this picture that open source, LL, open source LLMs cannot uh, zero shot API usage, but I disagree with that. I think that they're trying to make this a bigger issue than it is because if they make it a bigger issue than it is, then you, you're you going to go and download their model and use their rapid API tool or whatever, right? So I think the secret is you don't actually need any of this code. You can just very easily make your own version of a language model that can extrapolate to unseen uh, APIs, and I think that if you wait a year, all LLMs will be able to use APIs without any explicit fine-tuning like they're going to be doing here. Uh, current state-of-the-art LLMs, ChatGPT, GPT-4, uh, which have demonstrated impressive competencies and skillfully, skillfully using tools and are closed source with their inner mechanisms opaque. This limits the democratization of AI technologies and the scope of community-driven innovation and development. Uh, we deem it urgent to empower open source LLMs. <laughs> so not only have they made a mountain out of a molehill here, but they've also decided to uh, make it a 
mountain that's on fire. You know, it's 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 a uh, critical for the safety of humankind for you to go and download a rapi rapid API uh, or create a rapid API account so you can download this tool llama. Okay, three phases of constructing Toolbench, how we train our API Retriever and Tool Llama. During the inference of an instruction, the API Retriever recommends relevant APIs to Tool Llama, which performs multiple rounds of API calls to derive the final answer. Okay, so you have your rapid API. Uh, that's basically just a giant data set of APIs that gets used to instruction generation, a solution path annotation. Okay, so I guess instruction generation is done by GPT. Then solution path annotation, and annotating the path it took to get to the final API call, right? Especially if you're kind of doing this uh, decision tree where maybe there's some API calls that are similar and you have to kind of pick which one you want and then from the output of that determine whether it was correct and so on. Then Toolbench is going to be their benchmark, and then SFT, I think that's uh, fine-tuning. So here they're going to be fine-tuning Llama, the OG uh, model out of Meta, and they're going to call it Tool Llama, which is the fine-tuned version of that. And actually, if you go to their GitHub, I did notice that they had versions here. So they have Tool Llama 7B, Tool Llama 7B LoRa, which is, I guess, just the LoRa if you want to take your own Llama 7B and uh, make it a Tool Llama. But then they also have a Tool Llama 2 7B, which is basically the, uh, I think these these are Llama 1, which is the older Llama, but you definitely want to be using the Llama 2 at this point, which is the new Llama. So they do have a fine-tuned version of that. But there's kind of some sketchy shit here. You're downloading, basically, their models from someone's fucking, like, Google Docs, very sketch. No check certificate, no certificate. You just unzip some random fucking zip file, f which is from a uh, WeChat ten cent. So <laughs> I don't know. Like, this basically sketched me out. It basically seems like potentially a way to get uh, Chinese spyware on your computer. But I don't know. Maybe I'm being overly cautious. Okay. Prior works have explored building instruction tuning data for tool use. They fail to fully simulate the tool use capabilities within LLMs and have inherent limitations, limited APIs. Okay, so they don't have as good of a data set as our uh, rapid API data set. Only consider a small scope with poor diversity. So data set is small and shitty. Constraint scenario. Existing works confined to instructions that only involve one single tool. Real-world scenarios require that multiple tools are interleaved together for multi-round tool execution to solve a complex task. This is kind of where I think the question that we asked at the beginning comes in, right? Where if your query is being sent to Wolfram Alpha, right? Let's just use Wolfram Alpha. Does Wolfram Alpha run an LLM that consumes your query and then turns it into the right API call and then you as an end user have no idea what the what the Wolfram Alpha API is because they have their own little uh, tool llama running or do you have a LLM running on your computer that has to interact with a bunch of different APIs right because if you have a LLM running on your computer that interacts with a bunch of APIs, then that LLM needs to be able to interact with a bunch of different LLMs, kind of what you're, uh, a bunch of different APIs, kind of like what they're describing here, right? Interleave together multiple tools, but if it's actually the other case, right, where every single company has their own little LLM that handles all of that for you, then you don't need to have an LLM that can use 10 different APIs because each API will have its own LLM that knows how to use only that LLM, only that API. So I think the real world scenario, I don't think that's fully figured out yet. I think there's still there's still questions that need to be answered and those questions are going to come down to like how can people make money and like stuff like that. So I don't know if I'm necessarily agreeing with this picture of the world that they're trying to paint here. 
Uh, they often assume that users specify the ideal API set, uh, which is infeasible when large collections of APIs are provided. Inferior planning and reasoning, existing works have adopted simple prompting method. Chain of thought, this is what we used for the uh, paper bot, uh, which cannot fully elicit the capabilities stored and thus fail to handle complex instructions. This issue is particularly severe for open source LLMs which exhibit markedly inferior reasoning capability. <laughs> Damn, really uh, putting down the Llama models, but I think that's because they're looking at Llama 1, right? This is Tool Llama, Tool Llama 2 is probably better. Uh, good morning, Joseph. How's it going? Uh, to simulate tool use capabilities with open source LLMs, we introduced Tool LLM, a general tool use framework of data construction, model training, and evaluation. We first collect a high quality instruction tuning data set tool bench. Constructed automatically using the latest ChatGPT. Wow, okay. <laughs> so tool bench is a synthetically generated API data set. So I don't know. Constructed automatically means that it is not high quality. Not, I mean, I'm a believer in the synthetic data, but if you're just using GPT 3.5 to create an API data set for you, I would not call that uh, collecting a high quality data set. I would call that generating a low quality, good enough data set. Yeah, it's not even GPT 4, so. Yeah, not not necessarily looking good right now. You know, so far in this paper, we have uh, obvious blatant SEO along with a kind of pump and dump scheme for this rapid API startup. We have uh, over making a mountain out of a molehill of the specific open source versus closed source so that they can better warrant their thing. And now we have uh, kind of twisting words and making it seem like this data set is amazing when really it's just generated with GPT 3.5. So a little bit of, of uh, over exaggeration seemed to be a theme here. API collection, we gather 16,000 representational, representational state transfers, REST APIs from rapid API. So Toolbench, because it's generated, I wouldn't call it high quality, but this data set here, 16,000 from Rapid API, I would actually say that is high quality. So, you know, as much as I am kind of shitting on them here because they're pumping their own product, Rapid API here, this these 16,000 APIs from Rapid API, probably much higher quality than Toolbench because it's real world APIs, right? It's actual APIs that are actually used by people. So therefore they're actually gonna be a good representation of the distribution of all APIs because that's the distribution that really matters here, right? The distribution that really matters here is if you were to somehow be able to collect every single API call in existence and you had them all in one data set, that data set, that distribution is what you're really trying to uh, improve on. But you can only get samples of that, right? But I would say that the rapid API data set probably a much better sample, much more representative sample than this uh, tool bench. These API spans 49 diverse ca categories such as social media, e-commerce, and weather. For each API, we crawl detailed documents including the functionality descriptions, required parameters, code snippets, and we, expend, we expect LLMs to learn to use APIs by comprehending these documents so that the model can generalize to unseen APIs. Right? Model can generalize to APIs unseen. That's the whole point. You want it to extrapolate from what it's seen during training. You want it to generalize outside of the training distribution. And that's why you want the training distribution to ideally be as similar to the actual test or inference distribution as possible. Uh, okay, comparison of our tool bench to notable instruction tuning data sets. Okay, so I guess these are other API data sets. So you have Toolbench, uh, real world API. Is it a real world API? Have you generated it with GPT? Constructed automatically? Isn't that completely incorrect? Hmm. 
multi-tool alpaca t-bench multi-step reasoning multi-tool scenario okay so maybe using multiple different apis uh, real api response so when you send a request is it actually giving you the real response or is it giving you a mock response is it like a mock api maybe that's what that means number of tools number of apis all of these data sets seem very small so at least they have them on that instances real api calls average reasoning traces so i guess how deep is the uh, reasoning thread so really doesn't go more than five back and forth it seems Instruction generation. We first sample APIs from the whole set and then prompt ChatGPT to generate diverse instructions for these APIs. Uh, okay, so maybe they aren't generating the APIs themselves. What they're generating is the scenario in which you're using that API. Okay, that makes a little bit more sense. So the APIs themselves come from actual real world APIs, but the interactions with the APIs are basically created via ChatGPT. So you're basically creating a data set of an LLM just interacting with these APIs, but the APIs are real. Okay, so that seems a little bit better. That's a little, I'm a little bit less, uh, less peeved by that. To cover practical scenarios, we curate instructions that involve both single tool and multi-tool scenarios. This ensures that our model learns not only interact with individual tools, but how to combine them to accomplish tasks. We annotate high quality responses to these instructions. Each response may contain multiple rounds of model reasoning and real-time API call. Okay, multiple rounds of model reasoning and real-time API calls to derive the final answer. And that's something that we haven't done, right? So in our paper bot stream, we would send one request to ChatGPT with, hey, here's the API, here's the request that I want, pick the API call for me. So that's basically kind of like a one shot, right? You're giving it all the context that it needs, but then you're asking it to give you the final answer immediately. Versus here, it sounds like they're creating this idea of a solution path, which is, okay, you have multiple rounds to determine the right API call. So here's the APIs, here's the a query that I want, uh, and then the model will say, okay, here's the API. And then you say, okay, well, is that really the API? And then it's like, okay, maybe not, maybe it's this one. So it has this ability to kind of like go back and forth in its own in context learning and eventually get to the final answer. Uh, GPT-4 has a low pass rate for complex instructions. To this, we didn't develop a novel depth-first search-based decision tree. So they keep using the word novel here because uh, whenever you publish a paper, you want something to be new, right? Novel just means new. And there's nothing novel about depth-first search in a decision tree. Like that's that's been around for decades, you know, so we'll see why they keep talk, calling it novel here. Bolster the planning, compare with the conventional chain of thought. DFSDT enables LLMs to evaluate multiple, a multitude of reasoning paths and make deliberate decisions to either retract steps or proceed, either retract steps or proceed along a promising path. So the retraction there is the, the search process Right, so in depth first search, you're kind of going as deep as possible first, and then you'll step back and then go down a different path. In fact, can we get a depth first search uh, GIF? I bet you there's a cool GIF for this. Uh, depth first search and then breadth first search. Yeah, this is perfect. So this might be a little bit redundant if you guys have done some programming before in your life, but a depth first search, you go all the way deep, and then you come back up, and then you go to the next deepest, and then you go come back up, and then you go to the next deepest, versus a breadth first search, you go as shallow as possible, and then go one level deeper. So these are the two kind of search primitives. I don't know if that's the right word, but generally, actually, the algorithm that uses neither of these, it's a combination of them. Uh, okay. This addresses tool use capabilities. What are the advantages? Uh, it depends on what matters. You know, sometimes uh, doing the thing that you need to do or exploring a node is very heavy. Sometimes traveling is very heavy, right? So imagine if uh, the edge here required a huge amount of computation where it was a robot and you had to travel a very long distance, then maybe you'd want to search the breadth 
first. Maybe search your local area, then go deep. Maybe the edge is very cheap and you can very quickly go in and out. So at that point, just go super deep, see where it ends. So the the problem itself is going to dictate whether depth first search or breadth first search or whether the combination of both of them, which is called A star, A star search. This is from robotics. Um, but the problem itself is going to determine which one is actually better. Okay. Uh, Tool eval backed up comprises two key metrics, pass rate, which measures the ability to successfully execute an instruction, and then win rate, which compares the quality and usefulness of the two solution paths. Demonstrate that tool eval achieves a high correlation with human evaluation and provides a robust, scalable, and reliable assessment for tool learning. Okay, so basically then, uh, once you have this data set and you can basically pretend to interact with an API, you can then get these solution paths. And then once you have these solution paths, you can basically evaluate them with tool eval. And tool eval will give you these two metrics here, pass rate and win rate. Tool Llama demonstrates compelling capability. Compelling capability, I like that. I like the uh, alliteration there. To handle both single tool and complex multi-tool instructions. You get robust generalization to previously unseen APIs, requiring only the API documentation to adapt new APIs effectively. Uh, this flexibility allows users to incorporate novel APIs seamlessly and thus enhancing the model's practical utility. Yeah, but I mean, to me, I just feel like this doesn't even fucking matter because <laughs> this this capability, right? Like fine tuning and like tool llama, like that's just gonna disappear. Like one year from now, GPT-5 will just be able to do this zero shot. So it's kind of a weird world where, where there's a huge amount of startups and, and that are trying to sell you these products that are basically uh, wrappers around GPT and other LLMs. But I think the reality is all of those are just going to disappear because the functionality that those wrappers and those products are selling you are functionality that is just going to get captured by the LLM itself, right? These LLMs are basically general intelligence, and even though right now they maybe have these issues with, hey, hey, sometimes they don't work for all the different APIs, like, eventually they will. And once they will, your entire product, your entire startup is just dead in the water because you just got disrupted. So, I don't know, it's a dangerous time to do an AI startup because you have to be able to convince me that a more capable general LLM isn't just going to immediately eat your lunch. Yeah, that's the question, is what does not disappear? Uh, we show that DFSDT serves as a general decision-making strategy to enhance the reasoning capabilities of LLMs. DFSDT broadens the search space by considering multiple reasoning traces and achieves be significantly better performance than React. We prompt ChatGPT to recommend relevant APIs for each instruction and use these informations to train a neural API retriever. Okay, so neural API retriever, they're just trying to be fancy here and add the word neural in front of it, but API retriever is basically just picks an API for you. Uh, integrate API Retriever, given an instruction, API Retriever recommends a set of relevant APIs, which are then sent to a llama for multi-round decision-making to derive the final answer. Show that despite shifting through, sifting through a large pool of APIs, the Retriever remarkably, exhibits remarkable retrieval precision. Wow, look at that. <laughs> the Retriever does retrieval stuff. Training APIs closely aligned with the ground truth. Work targets empowering open source LLMs to execute complex instructions involving diverse APIs and practical scenarios. We hope this will inspire further research in the intersection of instruction tuning and tool use, which is kind of what I'm trying to argue that is just going to disappear. Uh, all right. Hierarchy of rapid API and the process of instruction generation. Okay, so rapid API, which is this startup product that at some point basically bundled all these APIs together and now they're kind of dead in the water of course because LLMs ate their lunch because LLMs can zero shot pick the right API so now they're trying to pivot 
I guess, and trying to become LLM based API. So this is the original uh, way, the original tree that was used to sort all of the APIs that they had at Rapid API. So maybe they had whatever, 16,000 different APIs. And whenever you would go there originally, there was some human that came up with this basically tree of like, okay, is your question about jobs? Is your question about movies? Okay, well, if your question is about movies, then uh, is your question about Star Wars characters or uh, IMDB rating? And then blah, 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 and you keep going down. So this this tree here, this graph or tree, I guess, is was created by humans working at Rapid API. Okay, so it's like a rough organization of a bunch of different APIs into these different genres and uh, based on different decisions, you can traverse down this tree and then pick the right API. Okay, and I guess at the high level it's called category, then tool, then API. And then here on the right here, they have single tool instructions. So category, tool, API, you have to make the right decision three times. Intra-category, multi-tool instruction, intra-category, multi-tool instruction. What? Oh, intra-collection, multi-tool instruction. Okay, so maybe you have, uh, for one category, multiple APIs that you want to use, or multiple tools, and then within those tools, there's APIs, so it helps you pick the right one. But again, the important thing here is that all of these abstractions are created by humans, right? This idea of there's a category, and then a collection, and then there's tools underneath the categories, and then there's APIs for each, those are all abstractions that were created by humans, so you're searching through an abstraction created by humans, like who cares? Just get rid of that abstraction and then you don't need that search process anymore. But, all right, I'll get off my high horse here. Uh, I read about a startup called Mosaic ML being purchased by Databricks for one billion. Mosaic ML focused on training LLMs rather than creating a novel LLM model. Yeah, there's a lot, there's, I heard about that acquisition. It's not, not super great, you know. I've, I've been in that world, you know. I've been in that world raising money for machine learning startups, and it's, it's a bunch of grifters. I'm just gonna be honest with you guys. Like, the people who are buying these companies, the people who are making these uh, acquisition rounds and funding rounds, like they don't know what the fuck they're talking about. They, they just are executing these like Ponzi schemes where they basically need to keep upping the ante and what are we talking about here? Right? Like, look at this. Raise $37 million? Like, what did you do with that $37 million? Is there anybody that uses this fucking Mosaic ML? All right, and now let's look at this. Let's look at uh, Databricks. Databricks on Crunchbase. Where is it? <laughs> Here we go. All right, Databricks, financials. And here's what you want to see. You want to go here and look at the investors for these. So who, these are the investors for Databricks, which somehow steep, keeps raising money, right? Like, why do you need a Series H, right? Like, why do you need a Series G, a, a $1.6 billion Series H? Like, what? Are you making money or are you not making money? Is anybody using your product or are you just basically just in the business of convincing a bunch of uh, VC bros that you need more money, right? That's kind of what I mean when I talk about uh, uh, Ponzi schemes where it's the business isn't raising money. Okay, so I'm not necessarily seeing the same VC firm. Sometimes that's an immediate red flag. If you look at the VC firms of the acquiring and uh, the acquiree company, and you can tell that they actually are the same ventures, but at least these are a little bit different. But I don't know. I still don't think that acquiring a company like Mosaic ML for a billion dollars makes absolutely any sense financially, but the financial world is really weird, and there's a reason I am no longer in that world. Heard Mosaic had a foundation in hardware. Spark is open source, which kind of eats some of Databricks commercial offerings. You're saying Mosaic ML originally made hardware? Is that what you're saying?
easily train and deploy generative AI models on your data in your secure environment. Trusted by ML experts. See, like that's all just trash. Like you don't, you don't need any of this to do that. I can, you can train and deploy generative AI models just by going on GitHub and using a bunch of Python packages. Uh, and your secure environment, that's just having some basic uh, computer security. Like, why do I need this product here? You know, like this website is not actually doing it. It's just trying to sell a VC on something. Apply to your code. Look at this ResNet. ResNet 18, ancient. I don't know. <laughs> Look at their founders. About us. Uh, 60 plus. Zaic ML people. Ooh, blanked out. I need to know who this is. Hung A. Lupachenko. Naveen Rao. Uh, CEO and co-founder at Mosaic ML. View on Twitter. Ancient, yeah. Yeah, I just know. I just, I just think that there's a world of grifters, you know. That's why I hide in the technical world. It's a lot more cozy. A lot more real, you know. You actually uh, are doing things rather than just kind of collecting money from fools. Uh, all right, let's go back to this paper before I get out of hand here. I don't want to get banned. Uh, the whole procedure finished up, which requires minimal human supervision and can be easily extended to new APIs. Start by introducing rapid API in its hierarchy, followed by how we crawl and filter APIs. Okay. Rapid API is the leading API marketplace that collects developers. So like, right, like what the fuck does this even mean? Leading API marketplace? Is that real? Like, is there a bunch of other API marketplaces and you've compared it? Like developers with thousands of real world APIs this is like a little st uh, startup pitch here. Developers can discover, test and connect to various APIs by registering only a rapid API key. Uh, classified into 49 coarse grain categories, blah, blah, blah. And then they go another level further, collections, and then blah, blah, blah. Okay, so this is the abstractions that they've created here of category collection tool and API. Hierarchy. Each tool is composed. Uh, we call the following, the name and the description, the URL of the host, and all available APIs belonging to the tool. For each API, records name, description, parameters, optional, Required parameters, optional parameters, request body and executable code snippets for the API call. And an example API call response. Okay, so I agree that this is kind of a good uh, abstraction here. I don't agree with this like category collection abstraction, but I do agree that, okay, you at least need the name, you need the description, you need the uh, actual thing that you're gonna call, you need the parameters, optional or required, you need the body, and then you need some example of how it's used. Maybe you don't need the example of how it's used. Uh, this rich and detailed metadata serves as a valuable resource to understand and effectively use the APIs. Uh, initially, we gather 10,000 tools from Rapid API. However, the quality and reliability can vary significantly. Some of these APIs are not maintained. Ooh. <laughs> okay, so maybe not. Maybe the whole Rapid API data set that I was talking about is actually a little bit trash because turns out that uh, some of the APIs uh, are not uh, well maintained and they return 404s, which is not found, which means that basically the uh, actual IMDB API, for example, has now changed the name of a function or gotten rid of that particular function. So you would have really hoped that a company like Rapid API would at least maybe every day or maybe every week they would ping every single API, every single function, just to make sure that it's still there. And then if they keep getting 404s, they'll basically get rid of that one. They'll say, hey, we kept pinging this thing and for the past four days, it hasn't returned anything. So therefore it's probably been deprecated, but it sounds like uh, you can't even rely on Rapid API to do that. And it sounds like 
uh, out of a bunch of their APIs, a bunch of them are not actually even real anymore. Perform a rigorous filtering to ensure that the ultimate tool set is reliable and functioning. Okay, so some data set cleaning, which I think is always a good idea. You always want to go through your data set and clean it. And if your data set is a bunch of APIs, I think pinging every single one of those and making sure that it actually is real and it returns what you expect, that's probably a good idea. So I agree with that. Uh, we begin by testing basic functionality and assert whether they are operational. Discard any APIs that do not meet this basic criterion. We make API calls to obtain an example response. Yeah, ascertain whether they are operational and obtain an example response. Uh, and evaluate the response time and the quality. I think response time you can definitely measure very easy, but quality is going to be difficult, right? Because quality is going to depend on what the actual API is doing. That's that's almost going to be very difficult to judge at all, even with something like a GPT-4. Uh, filter out the APIs with low-quality responses, such as HTML source codes or other error messages, and we only retain 3,451. So that's actually quite intense. Look at this. So the original data set from Rapid API has 53,000 APIs. The clean data set, where all they're doing is just basically getting rid of the bogus ones that return 404s, is 16,000 APIs. So that just gives you an idea there. You went from 53,000 to 16,000. So the data set, 75% of this data set, maybe a little bit less than that, like was basically trash. So <laughs> leading platform, exactly. The uh, true pioneers in API uh, management. When examining the response returned, we discover that some responses may contain redundant information that are too long to be fed into LLMs. This may lead to some problems for the limited context length of LLMs. Yeah, so maybe some APIs return huge JSON blurbs that you can't even fit inside the context of an LLM. I think, what is the LLAMA2 context? It's like 8,000 tokens, something like that. Uh, 2048, I think it's more than that, right? 4,000. Okay, so the Llama 2 context is about 4,000. So maybe you have this giant uh, response that has just like all this extra crap and it's way more than you can even fit into an LLM uh, context. And especially if they're going to be doing these like multi uh, step, like back and forth, back and forth before you can pick. What, what were they calling it? Uh, these multi step solution paths, then yeah, you definitely need the response to be able to fit inside the context. Uh, since API has a limit fixed response format, we use ChatGPT to analyze one response example and remove unimportant keys within the response to reduce its length. I mean, this is a little bit sketchy because what is unimportant, right? How are you determining whether the key is unimportant or not? Uh, tool documentation. Uh, parameters three in-context learning examples, each containing an original response and a compressed response schema written by experts. Okay, so I was gonna I was gonna say, how do they remove the unimportant keys and it's uh, experts are gonna do that. So basically for every response, they have some expert go through, get rid of all the keys that don't matter, and then that's called the compressed response. We obtain the response compression strategies for all APIs. During inference, when the API response exceeds 2048 tokens, we can compress the response by removing unimportant information. The compressed response is still longer than 2048, then we only retain the first 2048 tokens. Yeah, and this is kind of just continuing along the theme that I was talking about, where it's like, okay, well now, because of the limitations of current LLMs and the context length, you have to have this uh, compressed response uh, module which will compress the returns for you but as soon as LLMs have a big enough context where it doesn't matter anymore think about 10x context 100x context then you won't need any of this compression response compression crap right so if you had a startup where you were doing the best response compression strategy as soon as uh, an LLM comes out that has 10x the amount of context or 100x the amount of context you're dead. So I don't know, I'm, I'm leading this thread all the way through this uh, paper. 
you guys came here for a tool LLM uh, discussion and instead you're hearing my pessimistic take on uh, venture capital and startups in the machine learning space. Generating high quality instructions requires two aspects, diversity to ensure the APIs and multi-tool usage. Okay, so obviously you want a bunch of different APIs and then I don't know about this multi-tool usage. They, they say real world situations that often demand the interplay of multiple tools. I would say that I don't know if that's necessarily required. I could see a world where you don't need to have that capability at all. Uh, we adopt a bottom-up approach for instruction generation. Instead of brainstorming instructions, we start from collected APIs and craft various instructions that solve them. Okay, define a total set of APIs as SAPI. Okay, so we're starting with some math notation here. We have a set of all APIs, SAPI. That fancy S used to denote that is a set of APIs. Uh, we sample a few APIs, so you have uh, a set of length n, uh, which is a subset, which is a sample from this original set of all APIs. So here's your subset. Oh my god. <laughs> Let's get it right. There we go. Almost, no. One more. Let's do this. There you go. Then we prompt ChatGPT to understand the functionalities and their interplay and then generate possible instructions that involve APIs in S sub N and relevant APIs for each instruction. So the relevant APIs in S sub N, i.e. this. So the instructions here, instruction one is generated by ChatGPT. So here they're basically creating a supervised learning data set is kind of what they're doing here. They're making it sound fancy with all this math notation, but at the end of the day, they're basically saying for every single API, uh, relevant API, we're going to generate instructions and there's going to be a one-to-one -one correspondence between instructions and relevant APIs, thereby creating a supervised learning data set, which we can use for fine tuning purposes. Uh, these instruction relevant API pairs will be used for training the API retriever. There you go, there's your supervised learning data set used for training this API retriever. Uh, to cover all APIs and most other combination, ensuring the diversity of our instructions. Composed of a general description of the intended instruction, a comprehensive documentation of each API, and three in context seed examples. Okay, so maybe three examples of using that API with slightly different seeds. Uh, seeds are basically the uh, what you put into a random process in order to get different results, right? So anytime you're doing anything that involves randomness, you're gonna ask the computer to give you a random number, for example, but the computer uh, is gonna use something called a seed to give you that random number. And if you give it the same seed, it'll give you the same random number and the same random number every time, right? And that's why seeds are very useful if you're doing any kind of uh, experiment where you need to repeat something multiple times and you want to have the same repeatable random behavior. But here they're gonna use different seeds because they want to make sure that the randomness is, is as diverse as possible. Each seed is an ideal instruction generation written by human experts. Okay, so maybe not. I was talking about random seeds here. They're basically just saying it's uh, human experts written. These seed examples are leveraged to better regulate through in-context learning. In total, we wrote 12 over 36. What do they mean by this? 12 to 36 diverse seed examples for the single tool and multi-tool. Okay, so 12 single tool and 36 multi-tool and randomly sampled each example at each time. Detailed prompts for instruction generation are detailed in Appendix 8.3. Let's see what some of those look like. Uh, okay. You will provide it a tool, its description, all the tools available, the descriptions, blah, blah, blah. Your task, so this they're typing this to GPT-4. Uh, your task involves creating 10 varied, innovative, and detailed user queries that employ multiple APIs. So they're basically asking uh, GPT-4 to generate a synthetic data set here. Uh, if the tool Climate News has three API calls, your query should articulate something akin to first, verify how it trains, finally find new information. A query that only uses one API call will not be accepted. You must incorporate the input parameters required for each API call. 
So, I mean, this is some basic prompt engineering shit here, but like, I don't think, does this additionally add anything? Like I would have just saved on the tokens and not put this additionally here and just only put this U. Uh, generate, blah, blah, blah. Don't merely say an address, provide the exact road. Specify wearables, milk, a blue blanket, pan. Uh, I don't think you want to actually provide examples like this. Sometimes I feel like those make it worse. You should also avoid asking for the input parameters required by the API call, but instead directly provide the API parameter in your query. The final three queries should be complex and lengthy, describing a complicated scenario where all the API calls can be utilized to provide a system with a simple describe a complicated scenario. Doesn't sound like a good way to generate a data set. Uh, each query, there should be multiple related APIs and so on. I don't know, this doesn't seem like <laughs> necessarily a good idea here. Uh, I shouldn't figure three for the single tool instructions. We iterate over each tool and generate instructions for its APIs. Okay, and the reason I'm saying it's not necessarily a good tool is do you think that the distribution of these instruction and APIs generated by ChatGPT are representative of the instructions and API pairs that you would get from actual humans. You know, you could say, yeah, of course, they're gonna be basically about the same, but I'm saying, okay, well, what does that basically about the same mean? Is that very different, completely different? Like, you know, having ChatGPT pretend to be human, sometimes it's gonna work, but I think sometimes it's not gonna work. And especially if you're using that as a data set you're introducing all kinds of weirdness there. Sparse random sampling often leads to a series of irrelevant tools that cannot be covered by a single instruction in a natural way. We leverage the rapid API hierarchy. Since tools belonging to the same category are generally related to each other, we randomly select two to five tools from the same category and sample at most three APIs from each tool to generate instructions. So it's like they're randomly picking APIs that are similar and then asking GPT to randomly create uh, quote unquote complicated uh, scenarios where you would use all three of the tools that are similar together. So that's that's kind of what I'm saying. It's like is that is that at all indicative of like real world use case? Like I don't know. <laughs> it sounds like a very weird synthetic data set. Uh, okay through rigorous human evaluation. We find that the instructions already have a high diversity that covers various practical scenarios. We provide visualization using Atlas to support our claim. After generating, what is this? Atlas Nomic. Okay, so broken ass link. That's not good. Maybe it's because of this percent sign here. Another error, okay. Broken links, you love to see it. Uh, after generating the initial set of instructions, we further filter those with the hallucinated relevant APIs by asserting whether they exist. Finally, we collect over 200K qualified instruction relevant API pairs, including blah, blah, blah instances for I1, I2, and I3. Okay. A comparison of DFSDT, which is their depth first search, and COT, which is chain of thought, and then React, which I guess is some other paper that tried to do something like this. We show part of the solution path annotation process using ChatGPT. Okay, so chain of thought, you have your original instruction, API call with normal response, API call with normal response, API call with error, API call with error, and then uh, fail. Okay, so I guess if you're doing chain of thought, the LLM is gonna tell you what the API call should return, but then you have to actually go out and call that API call, and if it errors and it fails. But I think what they're not showing here is that generally you're just gonna have another arrow that goes all the way up here and then comes back, which is what we did in 
uh, PaperBot. If PaperBot could not find a uh, appropriate instruction, it would just say, I don't know what that is, and then it'll you can try again. Here in uh, depth first search, which is what they're doing here, uh, you give it the instruction, it has it says, okay, well, there's actually a bunch of different possible APIs that this could be. Let me, uh, I guess, try to call this one first. And then I try to call this one, and it's an error. So then I go back and I try to call this one, and that one seems fine. And then it eventually leads to an error. So then I come here and I tr try to call this one. And then I guess that leads to an error. So then I call this one. So I don't know. Like, I feel like the, the only reason this is relevant is because you've, it's like, you've created the problem and then solved the problem. It's like you've created this, you've you've put this into a tree, into a decision tree, and then because now it's in a decision tree, you can run a depth first search, but the question is whether it was even worth putting it in a decision tree to begin with. Uh, okay, so that's difference between chain of thought and their depth first search. And now here on this right side, you have an example of the solution path. So a solution path might look something like this. So your instruction would be, I want to give my birthday, my friend a birthday surprise, blah, 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 her favorite actress. And then ChatGPT is like, okay, uh, let me get this API name. Here are the possible arguments for that API call. So here's your function name, here's your arguments. Uh, it's going to send it to Rapid API. Rapid API is going to, I guess pick, or no, Rapid API is going to actually perform that API call. That API call is going to come back with two answers. It's going to say, okay, here's a response to that call, and then here's another response to that call. This response here is actually an error because it says 404, not available, can't find it. Then ChatGPT gets the answers, right? It gets multiple answers. So I guess that's what's happening here is you're getting multiple API calls. Uh, you're performing multiple API calls using Rapid API. You're getting multiple responses, and then you're asking ChatGPT to read all of those responses and then pick whichever one is the final answer. Uh, finish with the final answer. Blah blah. blah. You could buy Spider One. Blah, blah. Okay. So based on this, it seems like maybe the the really the only difference is that here you're performing multiple API calls and then picking the one that has the best response rather than uh, just calling the API call that is the best and then using that as your response. So it's, it's almost more of like a top K type of thing where you're picking the best out of top K, but you're calling uh, three different APIs. So, you know, who benefits here? Rapid API benefits because now you used to just send one query to Rapid API and pay them one cent for that, but now you're sending three queries to Rapid API and paying them three cents for each of those queries, right? Now, what if that API call is very expensive, right? What if that API call is fine-tuning a model? Do you really want to fine-tune six different models and then pick the one that is the best? Like, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if, like, kind of shotgunning like that is necessarily what you want. Given an instruction, we prompt ChatGPT to search for a valid action sequence. Okay, sequence of actions. Uh, such a multi-step decision-making process is cast as a multi-round conversation for ChatGPT. At each time step t, the model generates an action a of t based on a previous interactions. Okay, so ChatGPT is a function. It is a function that is receiving or a of t or generates a of t and it is conditional on, that's what this parallel bar is, it's conditional on a sequence of actions and responses and as well as the instruction. Okay, where R star denotes the real API response. So this is for action one, which is something like this. This is your action uh, and your response would be this here, your return, which I guess is where the R comes from. For each action AFT, we prompt ChatGPT to specify which API to use, the specific parameters, and its thought. Uh, in other words, AFT has the following format. Here the decision space is the Cartesian product of the thought, available APIs, and possible parameters. That's a infinite by nature. Curse of dimensionality applies. To leverage the function call, we treat each API as a special function and feeds API documentation to the ChatGPT function field. 
and this way the model understands how to call the API. For each instruction, we feed all the sampled APIs in this subset of uh, samples to ChatGPT as available functions instead of only its relevant APIs as relevant. It's going to explode your ChatGPT tokens. Like <laughs> You're going to blow up your uh, usage. In a way, the model gains access to a broader scope of APIs and expands the action space. So give it more options so it can uh, take more possible actions, but that also means that it can be more confused because there's more possible actions to take. Finish with final answer and finish by giving up. The former function has a parameter that corresponds to a detailed final answer, while the latter function has no parameter for cases designed while the provided APIs cannot successfully complete the original instruction after multiple rounds. Depth first search based decision tree. Conventional chain of thought has inherent limitations for decision making. A mistaken action may propagate the errors further and cause the model to be trapped in a faulty loop. Okay such as continuously calling an API in a wrong call or hallucinating APIs. Uh, maybe an issue if your entire data set is uh, hallucinated. Although the action space is infinite, caught or react only explores one possible direction leading to limited exploration of the whole action space. But again, that limited exploration might actually be a benefit, especially if your API calls are expensive. Hence, even GPT-4 often fails to find a valid solution path. We propose to construct a decision tree to expand the search space and increase the possibility of finding a valid path. And as soon as you have this decision tree constructed, then basically you can uh, use depth first search to go through it. Expand an existing node by calling the finish by giving up. During node expansion, to diversify the child nodes and expand the search space, we prompt ChatGPT with the information of the previously generated nodes and explicitly like <laughs> There's so much crap going in here. It's like they're just like thousands and thousands of tokens just explaining everything at every point. You know, now ChatGPT, you're feeding it in all this context of all these extra APIs. You're feeding it all this context of like, hey, you're actually exploring a decision tree. Here is previous nodes. Here's what's the next node that you should go. Like, isn't it just easier just to like ask the LLM directly, hey, which API should I use? And it's like, here, this one. And you don't need to give it all this extra context here. Make it play this game. <laughs> this seems so complicated. Yeah, it's... It's, it's not actually that complicated, like the, the actual, it's not that complicated, but it's overly engineered. That's, that's the word I would use. It's, it's like you're creating problems to then solve those problems. And you're creating all these abstractions that don't need to be there, right? Like the, this fucking uh, API retriever. Uh, you're creating this uh, data set of instruction to API sets so that you can fine tune something to pick the right, uh, API set based on the instruction and then you're going to uh, list that entire API set into the context and then uh, tell ChatGPT that you're now exploring this API set through a decision tree and that it has to use depth first search to search through that decision tree that depth first search is implemented in a separate uh, search retriever module so now you have like 10 different modules like over engineered you know like just literally delete all of that and just call the LLM directly and you're good to go. Uh, we choose to perform pre-order traversal, which is detailed. Overall, the design achieves similar performance while significantly reducing cost. We generate 12,000 instruction tuning pairs. Although it is possible to construct more training instances, we find that 12,000 brings satisfying generalization performance. Okay. Conduct experiments to investigate the performance. We start evaluating. We start by introducing the evaluation metric. We evaluate the efficacy of API retriever and DFSDT, and then present the experiments and analysis. Uh, okay, what are they going to compare to? Considering the API's temporal variability, I guess that's just a fancy way of saying that APIs change, right? Over time, people are going to add things to their APIs, remove things from their APIs. They might change the 
uh, parameters that go in, the required parameters, non-required parameters, like those things change over time. But it also means that you can't have a fixed ground truth solution path for each test instruction. Uh, I think even more than uh, for other stuff, AI should be simple. Yeah, simple is key. Agreed. Considering that human evaluation can be time consuming, we follow Alpaca Eval to develop an efficient machine learning evaluator tool eval, which incorporates two evaluation metrics. Okay, so now they have their evaluator, which is how they're going to automatically evaluate these uh, solution paths. So, pass rate proportion of successfully completing an instruction within a limited number of actions 200 actions. Damn, it's a lot of actions. That's a lot of lot of tokens that you're paying for there measures the execute executability of instructions for an LLM can be seen as a basic requirement uh, we treat the percentage of outputting this action in the last as the pass rate okay so how many times when you go through this tree the LLM actually decides to say I am done and this is going to be the final answer so the LLM is telling you when it thinks it's gotten the proper, it's used the proper API call and it's received the proper answer. Uh, and then win rate, the other metric that they're going to use to evaluate here, it's how well it is completed. It is measured by comparing two solution paths for a given instruction. We predefine a set of criteria for a better path. Okay, so it's probably just shorter. Okay, so now you have how how do you define a better path? Uh, if both answers solve, choose the one with smaller total steps. If total steps are the same, choose the one with a better final answer quality. So how do you determine final answer quality? Uh, if both answers fail, choose the one considering more successful. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so this is kind of a a non-answer here because basically it comes down to which one has the better quality and like what does that even mean. We evaluate multiple times then we calculate the percentage of being preferred by the evaluate tor. Okay so ultimately they're trying to proxy human preference here. Validate the reliability we sample among three different methods to obtain solution pairs for 600 test instructions. Okay so they have a holdout test set of weird API calls. Then we engage humans to annotate human preference for them. Our ChatGPT evaluator demonstrates a high correlation with human annotators. That's not a high correlation. Uh, the results show that our evaluator generates highly similar evaluation results and can be viewed as an incredible evaluator who simulates human preference. We find that our automatic evaluator achieves lower variance than humans barely lower when annotating multiple times for the same instruction. Our evaluator is more consistent than humans. I don't know about that. We compare API Retriever with two baselines, ADA embeddings and BM25. Intra-category multi-tool and intra-collection multi-tool. And then the whole data set. What the fuck is this? What is NDGC, NDCG5? What is this? NDCG3? I guess this is basically top five and then top one. So it has to get it correct on the first one and it has to get it correct in the top five. What? Pass rate for different reasoning strategies. It only passes at a 54% rate? Sounds absolutely terrible. API Retriever aims to retrieve relevant APIs to an instruction. We follow sentence BERT to train a diverse retrieval based on BERT base. Oh, uh, now I know why they were kept saying neural retriever, neural retriever. It's because they're literally training a BERT base, which is actually a very old uh, language model, like ancient language model. And they're training a dense one. Model encourages the instruction API documents into two embeddings. Encodes. Okay, so the 
BERT is being used to encode the instruction, which is a sequence of text, and then the API document, which is another sequence of text, into two embeddings, which are basically vectors, right? Some vectors in some high dimensional space that represent that instruction and that represent that API document. Uh, and then the relevance is determined by the similarity of these two embeddings. So similarity just basically means, uh, are those two embedding vectors pointing in the same direction, right? Kind of the standard uh, cosine similarity between those two vectors. But I don't think you need to, I feel like you, you definitely didn't need to tr train a BERT base from scratch in order to do that. I feel like if you would have, taken just the standard uh, embedding API that OpenAI gives you, API reference, embeddings, this one here, this embedding over here probably, if you fed your instruction into that and then you fed your API document and then got the embeddings for those, probably be just as good if not better than the uh, relevance that they're getting from here. Uh, we regard the relevant APIs of each instruction as positive examples and sample a few APIs as negative examples for contrastive learning. Okay, so what they're talking about here is in contrastive learning, you're basically comparing things in these embedding spaces and one way to do it is that you say, okay, here, these two things should be close together in the embedding space and these two things should be far away from each other in the embedding space. So the negative examples are used as examples of embeddings that should be far away from the embedding that you want and the positive examples are examples of things that should be close together so they're basically contrastively training a BERT base from scratch on uh, instructions and API documents. Uh, we choose BM25 and OpenAI's text embedding API. I guess they do compare so that that is what they're comparing against. Okay, interesting. So that's this one up here. Okay, so maybe there is a little bit of an improvement there. So picking the right API by looking at the uh, ADA embedding of the instruction and the ADA embedding of the API uh, documentation, if you were to use OpenAI's embeddings, you would pick the right API roughly 57% of the time versus if you use their uh, BERT model trained from scratch, it'll pick it 84% of the time. Okay. So you're getting a little bit of an improvement there, but I don't know. I don't know if it's worth it. Train to evaluate the model on a single tool instruction, intercategory multi tool instructions, and intra collection multi tool instructions. So, categories and collections again are these random human designed met, uh, hierarchies that they've created to classify APIs and to sort them into these little groups. Consistently outperforms across different types of instructions. The high NDCG score indicates its efficacy. Uh, I1 is much higher than I2 and I3, which means single, single tool instructions are relatively simpler for API retrieval than multi-tool counterparts. I feel like we kind of knew that beforehand. Uh, comparing DFSDT and React. Uh, we compare DFSDT and React on three different types of instructions. We choose a pass rate. Since DFSDT consumes more OpenAI API calls than React, for a fair comparison, we also establish a React at N baseline. Yeah, this is kind of one thing that I've been noticing in this paper is there's you're going to you're going to use a lot of API calls because you're feeding all this extra context into the uh, language model about this tree and this possible set of uh, API calls and you're going to have to traverse through this set of possible a or this tree of API calls and here's all the different nodes that you've already visited and here's the edges that you've gone through and all of that. So is it worth all those OpenAI API calls just to guarantee that you're using the right API call? Uh, okay, so because of that, they can't directly compare to React, so they're gonna come up with a new version of React that has the same amount of uh, OpenAI API calls. 
significantly outperforms, showing that DFSDT is a more efficient way that saves costs for a solution path annotation. I would say that <laughs> that's just complete garbage. If, within the solution path annotation framework, DFSDT is more efficient. But if you just get rid of the solution path bullshit, that's going to be way more efficient than this. This means that beside efficiency can solve those complex difficult instructions that are unanswerable by vanilla react no matter how many times it is performed involving such hard examples can fully elicit the tool use capabilities okay so they fine-tune a llama 7b using the instruction solution pairs the original llama is pre-trained sequence like the 2048 we use positional interpolation to extend the context length up to 88,000 Okay, so when you actually do this, you, you're you losing some of it. It's not paying as much attention to every single thing. So even though you now have a longer context length, at the quality of the information that's going into the actual Llama 7B model is not going to be as good. So that's another thing to think about here. Uh, and individual tokens actually are very important for API calls because the difference between using the right argument and not using the right argument the right data type not the right data, like those things really matter so if you're kind of doing these like fuzzy uh context increasing uh techniques i feel like that that could be a potential issue i'm like super critical today guys and i apologize you know normally i'm not this negative Experiments win rate is calculated by comparing each model with ChatGPT React. Win rate higher than 50% means the model performs better. Uh, Tool Llama, ChatGPT, DFSDT, and Text DaVinci DFSDT. So the reason they can change the uh, model that they're using here is because these, this entire DFSDT is basically a prompt engineered thing it's like basically just a bunch of text describing this tree and describing the path through this tree so you can change the quote-unquote LLM backend really easily and they're actually showing you here that ChatGPT performs better than their fine-tuned llama <laughs> they're using this complexity to justify all the past work yeah, that's kind of what I'm feeling too. It's like, it kind of like, I don't know if you guys have seen the Wolfram Alpha. If you know that guy, the, the guy who does Wolfram Alpha, what's his name? I think it's literally Wolfram, Stephen Wolfram, right? And like, he's going around now talking about how the Wolfram API is integrated into ChatGPT. So you can ask ChatGPT things and it'll call Wolfram Alpha for you. And one thing that I, when I when I watch that guy talk, that makes me a little bit sad is like, he still thinks in his head that ten years from now, you're gonna have a language model that calls the Wolfram API to ask what the capital of France is, and then the Wolfram API returns the capital of France is Paris, and then the LLM tells you, okay, I use the Wolfram API to do that, and it's like he's still living in this world where the LLMs are basically frozen in time and don't get better over time so that all the work that he's done building this Wolfram API is still useful. But the reason I think it's sad is because I think that's not actually, that's not all what's going to happen. Like I think the LLMs are going to eat everything, like every single piece of software, every single specialized piece of software, every single API, every single module is at some point just going to get folded into the LLM, right? And it's, and it's going to be, Maybe a little bit slow at first, but over time, literally everything will be done by just one giant LLM. And you won't need any specialized APIs, any type of specialized knowledge bases. The whole vector database, also a bunch of garbage. Like, we're, we're, we're kind of converging into this singularity point where everything is run by one LLM. And not only is it one LLM, but it's the same LLM everywhere. Right, so even just the idea of fine tuning, where oh, I'm going to fine tune this LLM for X, and I'm going to fine tune this one for this, and I'm going to have uh, this LLM for that. Like 
that's also going to eventually go away. You're just going to have one LLM that is so good at everything that you use it for everything. <laughs> All right, I'll stop there. Uh, okay, scaling the number of diversity and in instructions and unique tools, tool LLM is expected to generalize to new instructions and APIs unseen during training. This is meaningful since users can define customized APIs and expect Tool Llama to adapt accordingly to the documentation. We strive to evaluate the generalization ability of our Tool Llama uh, unseen tools. So generalization basically means can this model generalize outside of the distribution that it's been trained on, right? So you have some set of APIs that it's seen in the training data. We're going to hold out or keep a set of APIs that it hasn't seen in its training, that's the holdout set or the test set, and then we're going to see how well it performs in those. Uh, single tool instructions, blah, blah, so different intra-category, intra-collection, randomly select six categories, leave the remaining 43 categories, conduct the evaluation of the aforementioned three levels since the training instructions. We only perform level one generalization since it already covers instructions from different categories. For each test instruction, we feed the ground truth to each model. This simulates a scenario where the uses, user specifies the API set that they prefer. Okay. Since the original Llama checkpoint is not fine-tuned towards any downstream task, it cannot be leveraged to use tools directly. Uh, incorrect. You can definitely use a Llama 2 that has not been fine-tuned for API retrieval, and you can ask it zero shot to pick the right API entirely in the context, and it's able to do that. So <laughs> that that truth, unfortunately, is very inconvenient for them because it would mean that this entire strategy is, is basically bogus. But that's the reality, is that they work zero shot. And they're only going to get better at this zero shot instruction following capability. Sophisticated prompt engineering for both models to elicit the best of their tool use abilities. We choose the teacher model and OpenAI as the baseline. Uh, apply React. When calculating the win rate, each model is compared with ChatGPT. Tool Llama significantly outperforms the conventional method for tool use in both pass rate and win rate. Tool Llama performs better than Text DaVinci 3. Uh, means their instruction following do not extend to tool use. This underscores the deficiency in current instruction tuning methods, which largely focus on enhancing language skills. In general, Tool Llama demonstrates competitive performance in all scenarios, achieving a pass rate highly, slightly lower than ChatGPT. These results demonstrate that Toolbench can elicit tool use capabilities and empower them to skillfully master even unseen APIs for various instructions. All right. Integrating API Retriever. You know what? Let's fucking do this. Let's go to GPT. Let's go to GPT-4. Say, generate for me a simple API for a uh, robot. Uh, give me the names of the functions as well as the parameters and their, their data types. I want this API to have five functions. All right, so we're using GPT to generate a synthetic data set of API function calls, or APIs. Okay, so it's gonna go ahead and it's gonna do that. Let's take it a little slow. But then we're gonna come here, we're gonna say uh, hugging face, or actually let's do the uh, replicate. Replicate. Let's go find Llama 270B chat. Okay. You are an API assistant. Pick. Yeah, Boo is right here. Come here, come here, Look at this little kitty. Look at you. You're such a cute little cat. Pick the right API call to use based on the instruction I give you, based on the instruction given. Simply return the name of the API function. All right, so then we're gonna come here. Uh, let's grab this here.
put that there. Here is the API. And let's uh, come up with some function call. So maybe pick up object. I want you to pick up the uh, banana. Let's do that. I want to pick up the banana. Banana. Okay, now let's see what Llama 2 tells us. It should tell us that we're going to use the uh, pick up object function. This one. Sure, to pick up the banana, you can use the pick up object API function. Here's an example of the call to the function pick up object object ID banana and it even told us that the uh, weight limit for a banana is about 0.5 kilogram because it already knows that bananas are roughly 0.5 kilograms so uh, it cannot be leveraged to use tools directly I don't know does that does that kind of seem like I just leveraged it to use tools directly kind of seems like I just did <laughs> okay so now that I've uh, Proved my point, let's go back and finish this paper. Users may not be able to manually recommend APIs from a large pool. To emulate this practical setting and test the efficiency, we praise the ground truth APIs with the top five APIs. So this is the uh, difference between, I think, the one, top one versus top five. So top five just basically means it has to pick the best out of the five. Use of our API only slightly diminishes the pass rate the average win rate for tool llama is 49%. This kind of makes it seem like it's a coin flip. Provides robust evidence of the capability, excellent capability. <laughs> what? I don't know about that. It also found the win rate also shows a slight increase. Since React can be viewed as a degraded version of DFSDT. Damn, all right. Trained only on data. The model can be used either through React or DFSDT. Uh, demonstrating its higher performance in decision-making tasks. We find that the improvements brought by DFSDT is more evident and demonstrates the expanding of the search space is extremely essential for those LLMs with inferior capabilities. I don't know if I agree with that either. I feel like expanding the search space just adds a bunch of extra contacts, which you have to pay the tokens for because you're paying the LLM bill. And also, it probably makes it more confusing if you have to pick the right API call out of a hundred different possible uh, APIs. It's a lot harder than picking the right API call if you just have one API that contains like a limited set of functions. Fine tune all the parameters to obtain tool llama. This is not the good way of fine tuning either. This is full fine tuning where you're not freezing anything, you're allowing the gradient to go all the way through the entire model and investigate how the performance is affected. Affect future attempts to design more sophisticated methods without sacrificing performance. Uh, related work, okay. I like this, I like the related work at the end. Generally a fan of that. Uh, mastering decision complex, here you have a bunch of papers. Gaining access to external tools, more papers, multimodal functionality, specialized skills in vertical domains. This is the stuff that's going away. Uh, open source LLMs lag far behind state-of-the-art LLMs. Do not agree with that. Tool usability is acquired by state-of-the-art LLMs remains unclear. It's because uh, language is the prior for general intelligence. Instruction tuning enhances LLMs understanding. Manually annotating instruction tuning data is time consuming. We generate high quality data from LLMs. Compared with the dialogue, tool learning is inherently more challenging given the vast diversity of APIs. often fails to find a valid solution path, hence the existing tool learning data set uh, cannot effectively address real human needs. Designed for practical scenarios and previous pipeline for tool learning. We target making LLMs generalized to a diverse tool use instead of focusing on a particular type of tool, which is less practical, is it? Generate grounded plans, better integrate reasoning, these studies do not incorporate a mechanism for decision retraction, which become problematic as an initial error can propagate along an action sequence. Instead, our DFSDT 
extends reflection to a more general method by allowing LLMs to assess different reasoning paths and select the most promising one. Mm. It is, I guess, more general, but you're just using a lot of... Shares a similar idea to the recent tree of thought reasoning. Yeah, there was a paper that I remember that did this as well, the tree of thought, where you're basically doing this same thing again, where you're allowing the LLM to construct this tree and then search through that tree. But I would say that you maybe don't need to do that at all. Addresses general decision-making problems where the decision space is infinite compared to TOT simple tasks that can be easily addressed by a brute force search. The distinct target determines the significant difference with the implementation. Notably, our method is designed for diverse decision-making tasks while TOT is tailored specifically for its selected task set. All right, this work introduces how to elicit tool use capabilities within LLMs. We present an instruction tuning data set which covers 16,000 real-world APIs and various practical use case scenarios, including both single tool and multi-tool tasks. The construction of Toolbench purely uses ChatGPT and requires minimal human supervision. Kind of maybe tells you a little bit about the quality though, right? We propose DFSDT to reinforce planning and reasoning, enable them to navigate through reasoning paths strategically. Uh, we devise automatic evaluator fine-tuning to obtain matches the performance of ChatGPT and exhibits remarkable generalization ability to unseen APIs. Besides, we develop a neural API retriever to recommend relevant APIs for each instruction. The retriever can be in integrated with Tool Llama as a more automated tool use pipeline. Right, but now you've got to load all these things into your GPU, right? Like, or where are we loading the neural API retriever? Are you loading that into the GPU as well? Like, is your CPU running all this crap? In general, this work paves the way for future research in the intersection of instruction tuning and tool use for LLMs. Okay. Uh, cool. So that's the end of that. Um, let's do a little paper summary. So today we read Tool LLM. This is a paper that kind of was making the rounds. It was popular on Papers with Code, which is a resource that I use all the time. And it's also popular in Hugging Face Papers. Uh, which is another uh, kind of you can see how like usually these papers have like 27 upvotes 16 upvotes and then if you actually go to uh, tool LM this one had 70 upvotes which is like kind of completely unheard of so huge amount of upvotes but uh, what else? The This paper has a accompanying GitHub repo that kind of seemingly tries to pump this product here, Rapid API, uh, which is a startup that basically has a bunch of APIs, but what we learned in this paper is that out of the 53,000 APIs in this website, where is it? Right here, yeah. 53,000 APIs on this uh website here they cleaned it and got rid of the APIs that return 404 and they got 16,000 APIs so literally over 75% of the APIs on this website are broken and garbage so not looking good but all right what does this paper largely do what this paper largely does is it basically uh, it had there's a couple different pieces so one piece is this idea of a basically decision tree and it creates a decision tree in text right it's basically a prompt engineered decision tree and then uh, goes back and forth with a language model and you can have you can use any language model and it'll basically craft this decision tree and search through this decision tree but all of that is being done in context right so you're telling the language model here's the current set of APIs here's where you're currently at in the decision tree should you uh, choose one of these or should you go a step back and pick the next thing and so on and uh, here's kind of what it looks like when it goes through that decision decision tree right it's crafting this tree and then it can go and traverse through it but every single time that it crafts or that it basically looks for the next set of nodes it'll actually call this rapid API and create 
basically say, here's three different API calls that could be the API call that you want. Here's the three different returns for each of those three different API calls. Is one of these the one that you wanted? So it's it seems like at the it's just picking the right API call, but underneath all of that, there's a huge amount of back and forth and back and forth with something like a chat GPT and something like a rapid API. So you're calling a bunch of APIs potentially hundreds of times, and you're calling ChatGPT hundreds of times back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So to you as the final end user, it looks like all you did is say, hey, I want to call this API that does this, and it just picks the right one. But behind the background, there's all this crap going on. So largely my my feeling with this paper is that it's over-engineered. It's, it's creating this large amount of complexity and kind of like a prompt engineering that it does everything in context. They also have, uh, they train a language model, an old language model, BERT, entirely on this synthetically created data set of instructions and APIs, and then use that to determine the quality of the return calls. So there's a lot of pieces here that I don't think are necessary and even the original kind of tree of uh, decision decision tree that it builds, I also don't think is necessary, necessary either. And all of this is argued, is, is required, because uh, language models are not good enough to pick the right API. So I actually went ahead and I did that. So I asked Llama270B here, I gave it an, uh, three diff or five different functions that it could pick, and I said, pick, uh, I want to pick up the banana, and it quite easily decided to uh, pick the right API call. So here we're seeing a language model that zero shot picks the right API call with the right parameters. So I just don't feel like this is going to last very long. I feel like this is a tool that's already outdated, you know, and I'm sure when GPT-5 comes out and when Llama 3 comes out that you're not going to need any of this, that all those LLMs will be able to zero shot uh, generalize outside of any API without having a any amount of fine tuning specific to the selection of APIs. Uh, but yeah, that's that's just what I think about that. You know, not super positive on this research direction, but overall, kind of a well written paper. You know, seems fine. Paper's fine, but I just think it's a little over-engineered and it's already outdated. And that's that. You know, not a super long stream. Kind of a, a bit of a dud on the paper here, but I appreciate you guys hanging around no matter what. Uh, thanks, Scott and Chris and Joseph and Sheldon and Ellie and everybody else came and dropped by. Thanks for watching. Thanks for hanging out. Uh, streams tomorrow and the day after as well. Uh, still got to figure out what I'm going to stream about, but it's usually one of these papers, so maybe wait for that. Maybe this avatar verse, high quality, stable 3D avatar creation from text and pose. Creative generation using diffusion prior constraints. They got cute animals. That's got to be worth it, right? Uh, but yeah, thanks for the stream. Thanks for being watchers. See you guys later. And have a great day.